Hi guys, welcome back to another video on Aisha's Academy. Trying to be consistent out here. Um, <laughs> if you saw my last post, you saw that I posted a video on a higher pass paper. Um, so now I'm just doing a foundation one. Um, I'm just going to be doing pass papers really and truly for the next, actually until my personal uni exams finish on the 19th of March um, and then I'll be coming back with the topic videos hopefully I might squeeze one or two before then but yeah let's crack on with this past paper so this is a foundation paper right so if we have a look at the first question it says change 365 centimeters into meters so if we know that there are a hundred centimeters <coughs> in one meter we need to go from 100 centimeters to meter technically we divide by a hundred and so if we have 365 centimeters into not one meter sorry into however many meters it is we would need to divide by 100 and divide by 100 is the same as moving back two decimal places because 100 has two zeros so one two and your answer would be 3.65 and then it says change 2.7 kilograms into grams we know that there are a thousand grams in one kg so to go from kg into grams we times by a thousand so if we have 2.7 kilograms to work out how many grams it is we would times by a thousand and we would be left with times and by a thousand is the same as moving forward three decimal places. So this is my technique for like hundreds, tens, thousands. So if it's a divide question, you move back decimal places by the number of zeros you have. If it's multiplication, you move forward by how many zeros you have. So if we have 2.7 and we're moving forward decimal places, so one, two, three, we end up with an answer of 2,700 grams okay and then question two basically says um work out two plus seven times ten so this is using our bod mass or some people say bid mass or same thing as bid mass just don't want to not include anyone's other methods so if we look at this, we've got addition before multiplication, but looking at bid mass, the M stands for multiplication, so you have to multiply first before you add. And so therefore, if we're going to do that, we would have to multiply the 7 and 10, which would be 70, and then we have to add that to our 2, which would be 7 t2 okay and then if we have a look at question three so um it says that y over four is equal to 10.5 so then if we have a look at that so y over four is the same as i think i've mentioned it in one of my videos before i think it was my fraction ones whenever you've got a fraction it's the same as dividing so it's the same as y divided by four is equal to 10.5 so to work out what y is if we move divide by 4 over the fence it becomes times by 4 so we're going to do 10.5 times 4 which is the same as times 2 then times 2 again so that would be 21 times 2 again which will be 42 yep okay and then if we have a look at question four, so question four was basically saying, um, here are four numbers. So in with these four numbers, we've got minus nine, minus two, two and nine. And we're basically trying to fit which two numbers are gonna give us minus seven. Bear in mind, this is an adding question. So definitely we know that the minus two, these two will definitely not go together. Um, if we have a look at minus 2 and 9, so we know minus 2 plus 9, or aka 9 plus minus 2, so let me write this down. 
that will give us an answer of positive 7. Same with 9 plus minus 2. Because remember, if you've got a plus and a minus next to each other, it becomes a negative. So 9 take away 2 is 7. So we know they won't work together. We know the minus 9 and the 9 definitely won't together. So let's look at the 2. The 2 and the positive 9 won't work together as well, because 2 plus 9 is 11. So and if we have a look at the 2 and the minus 9, we definitely know that 2 minus 9 will give us negative 7. Same with if it's vice versa. If we had negative 9 plus 2 as well, we would also get minus 7. So one thing I want you to note with this adding question is that you would have been given the marks as well. Let's say if you wrote it the other way around and you said 2 plus negative 9 you would have still gotten the marks because you've used the correct combination of numbers. And when you're adding um, specifically, it doesn't really matter which order the numbers are. You always get the right answer. So that is question four. And then moving on to question five. Um, we've got four terms in a sequence. And it basically, we want to rule out no, sorry, it says the rule of the sequence is <clears throat> you multiply the previous term by 2 and then you add 1. So by doing that, the last term we have here is 23. So if it says multiply it by 2, we know 23 times 2 is 46, and then add 1. So 46 plus 1 would be 47. And then moving on to question 6. So question six, we have five straight rods and it says the total length of the five, five rods is L centimetres and it wants us to form a, for, oh, I can't even speak, <laughs> it wants us to form a formula or find a formula um, for L in terms of A. So looking at the five rods, so we've got A minus one plus A plus another A plus another A plus a plus 4. So if we look at how many a's we have together, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So in total we have 5a. And then we've got minus 1 plus 4. So minus 1 plus 4 would leave us with an answer of 3. So we've got 5a plus 3. So that's literally it for that. You would literally just add it together and then always remember that you know, whenever you're forming formulas, you always simplify and collect like terms. So you just add the A's together and add the numbers together. So that's that. And then moving on to question seven, it wants us to write the coordinate for point A. So then having a look at this graph, point A is down here. And I mentioned in the higher past paper video as well, um, for those of you that may have seen it, but whenever writing coordinates, you write your X value before your Y. So our X value is six. Then we write our y value, which is minus 2. And that's it. And then part B of that question is it says plot the point with the coordinates 2, 9. So if it's 2, 9, we know our x value is 2 and the y value is 9. So our x value of 2 would be along this line. Our y value of 9 would be along there. And where they both cross would be the coordinate. So if I rub everything else out because it's irrelevant now. We know that the point, I'm just going to make it nice and neatly, the point was here. Obviously, plot it in black, but I just wanted to add a splash of colour. And because it literally says label B, we are going to label it B. Then it says, does point B lie on the, on the straight line with the equation Y is equal to 4X plus 1? And then it says, you must show how you get your answer. So... To see whether this point lies on the straight line, there's a few ways that you could actually answer this question. You could either literally draw a line, so you could either draw the line. So if we've got an equation, but that would take you quite a long time, and bearing in mind, if we have a look at its marks, it's literally only a one mark question. So I wouldn't bother trying to think of all the coordinates that fall on that line. So the quickest way for me is literally to substitute. So we know that the coordinates for B again was two, nine. So I'm gonna substitute these coordinates into the equation Y is equal to four X plus one. So our Y value is nine, our X is two. So nine is equal to four times two plus one. 4 times 2 is 8, plus 1 is 9. Oh. <laughs> 4 
sorry, is eight plus one is nine, but I just wrote it all wrong. <laughs> so yeah, they are the same. So therefore, eight plus one is equal to nine. So then based on that, I could say, therefore, point B is on the line y is equal to 4x plus 1. Then it says on the grid, draw the line with the equation x is equal to minus 2. So x being equal to minus 2 is here. So that straight line will be here. So remember, if it's a point on the x-axis, its actual line is in the opposite direction so if we know the x-axis is this way then the point of that line is actually here and the reason being is because if we look at this line every point and sorry every point on there the x value is minus two so having a look at question eight it says that the length of a rectangle is twice as long as the width of a rectangle so it says the area of a rectangle is 32 centimeters squared it says draw the rectangle on the centimeter grid so if i visualize this here is our rectangle it says that the length is twice as long as the width so let's say if this is our length this is our width but it says our length is basically two times the width so in terms of working out so i'm going to substitute that now for the length for 2w then to work out an area of a rectangle it's always length times width equals the area but because we've substituted the length with 2w it's going to be the same as 2w times w is equal to area 2w times w will leave us with 2w squared as the area the area is equivalent to as it mentions 32 centimeters squared so we need to work out what the width is first before we can find out our length because if we know the width we can work out what the length is so 32 divided by 2 is 16 so w is equal so w squared is equal to 16 so w would be equal to the square root of 16 which is positive or negative 4 but you know dealing with lengths you would mainly only get positive numbers you can't really have a negative length so we know w is equal to 4 so therefore the length will be 2 times 4 which is 8 and so because this is a centimeter grid what that means is that each part of the box is 1 centimeter so because we know our length is 8 centimeters I want to make sure I have 8 boxes apart so that would be up to there excuse for the non straight line and then a width of four so four boxes apart and this would be my rectangle so moving on to question nine question nine it goes on to say jack is it jacqui jack jock <laughs> um jacqui wants to work out 3480 divided by five she knows that um, 3,480 divided by 10 is 348, that's correct. So she's now saying that 3,480 3, divided by 5 would be 174 because 10 divided by 5 is 2 um, and 348 divided by 2 is 174. So what mistake did she make? So let's have a look at it. So let's put into perspective easier numbers. I always like to put into perspective easier numbers for you to get the, the twist. So let's say if we're looking at 100 divided by 5. So we know 105 divided by 5 is 20. But 100 divided by 10 would be 10. So in order of working out what 100 divided by 5 is, we do know that 10 divided by 5 is equal to 2. But therefore, in order to work out what 100 divided by 5 is, if we knew that 100 divided by 10 is 10, we would have to times by 2. Her mistake of what she did was in order to do that, if you look at it in parallel of what we've done, she should have times 348 by 2. So, Jacques Cui should have multiplied. 348 by 2, not divide. 
Yep. Okay. So now having a look at question ten. Okay, so it says Jake and Sarah each played a computer game six times. Who had the most consistent scores? Jake or Sarah? You must give a reason. So let's look at the scores. Jake looks pretty consistent to me. You know, a bit of 10, 9, 8, 11, 12, 8. They're not really that far apart. Whereas Sarah's gone from 2 to 10 to 7 to 14. That is a bit of a mad jump. So I'm going to go with Jake over here. So I would say Jake was more consistent because... His scores are closer together. Yep, so that's pretty much it. And then it goes on to part B, where it's now showing a stem and leaf diagram, which I actually do have a video of. Um, I did that quite recently, so I'm just going to plug the link at the top. Um, so it shows the stem and leaf diagram, and it says that his modal score was six points because six occurs the most in the diagram. So mode is our most common number. So for those of you that are unaware, mode is most common. However, Looking at the stem and leaf, and to refresh your memory, the sixes here do not represent six. They represent 26, 26, 26, 26. So really and truly, looking at this stem and leaf diagram, it's not six that comes up a lot as the most common, because your most common is the number that comes up the most. So the mode is actually... Twenty six, not six. So he is incorrect, and I hope that makes sense. Right. So there are thirty children in a nursery school. At least one adult is needed for every eight children in the school. Work out the least number of adults. So if we know that for every eight children, I need one adult. So. 8c1 adult, 16 children would need 2 adults, 24 children would need 3 adults, and 32 children would need 4 adults. But we have 30 children, so really and truly I'm going to need 4 adults, purely because 30 is bigger than 24. And so if I had 3 adults for 30 children, I wouldn't have enough. And bear in mind it says at least 1 adult for um, eight children, so it would be four. And then it says two more children are to join the nursery. Does this mean that more adults are needed? No, because we know 30 plus two is 32. And as we've worked out, for 32 children, we would need four adults. So our reason is no, because you can see anything along the lines of 32 divided by eight is four. So, Looking at question 12, um, it goes on to show a two-way table. So we basically just need to fill it in for the first part. Nice and beautiful three marks. So looking at this table, first of all, it says that 30 of the rabbits are male. So in knowing that, we know that this number in here plus this number is going to give us a total of 30 because 30 males and so if in total she has 45 rabbits because that's the total if we know 30 are male therefore 15 would be female because 45 take away 30 is 15 sorry yeah it is I don't know why I apologize then it says eight of the female rabbits have short hair so female with short hair is eight then it says 12 of the rabbits with long hair are male so male long hair is 12 then 12 plus something will be 30, which is 18. Then 8 plus something is 15, which is 7. And so if we add these two rows together, that's going to give us our totals here. So 12 plus 7 is 19. 
18 plus 8 is 26. And if we have a look, um, 26 plus 19 is 45. So we know those values are correct. Then it says if one of Emma's rabbits is chosen at random. So what is the prob probability of this rabbit um, being a female with short hair? So we have 45 in total. So out of 45, female with short hair is 8. So it's going to be an 8 out of 45 probability. Remember, for probability, they can be represented as percentage, percentages, decimals, and fractions. And looking at this two-way table, I personally feel like with two-way tables, it's easier to put it into fractions because decimals are quite complicated, especially if you don't have a calculator to work that out on your head. And same with percentages. So, yeah, that's that. Then if we look at question 13, it says the total surface area of a cube is 294 centimetres squared. So what is the volume? So the volume of a cube. I'm just going to draw one quickly. Not m much of an artist at all, but, you know, we move. So <laughs> this is our cube. So. If we know what the surface area of the cube is, to work out an area from a surface area, you would have to do the surface area divided by the number of sides, which on a cube is six. And the reason why is because your surface area is basically the total area of all the surfaces. And we know on a cube, it has six surfaces. So to work out the area, we would have to do 294 divided by 6. Obviously, we do not have a calculator, so we're going to be using box method. So how many twos? 6 fit into 2 cannot do that. So 6 into 29, we know that we can do that 4 times, remainder 5, and then 6 into 54 is 9. So that would be 49 is the area, the area of in one side. So then the volume is, so if we know the area is one side, that means each side of the square, yeah, of the square, aka the area, would be 7, because we know that for each side, we would do the square root of 49, which is 7 centimetres. So then in terms of working out what the volume of a cube is, volume of a cube is equal to length times width times height. Basically, on a cube, um, it's made up of squares. And we know on a square, all the sides are the same. So AKA, you just multiply them all by seven. Sorry, you multiply them all three times. So we're gonna end up doing seven times seven times seven. So we know seven times seven is 49. So then to do seven times 49, we can do column. So 7 times 9 is 63, carry the 6, 7 times 4 is 28, plus the 6, which is 34. So the final answer is 343. So here are two fractions, and it wants us to work out which of these fractions is closer to 1. So looking at them both, um, we've got 7 over 5, and 5 over 7. So really and truly, the only way I can think of which one is closer to 1 is, there's two ways you can do this. I would say um, make them both the same denominator. So if we look at this, 7 over 5, if we make them, and 5 over 7, make them both have a denominator of 35. Oh, bless me. So then we know 7 times 5 is 35, and so times the top by 5 as well, we end up with 25. And then we know 5 times 7 is 35, so multiply the top by 7, we end up with the top of 49. And so if we have a look, we know that to get from 25 over 35 to 35 over 35, because 35 over 35 is equivalent to 1, um, we would have to add 10. But to get from 49 to 35 to 35 over 35, we would have to take away 14. And when you look at it, 10 is a smaller distance compared to 14. 
And so I'd say the one that's closest to 1 is 5 over 7. And that's literally that for that. So, looking at question 15, a bit of ratio ratios, which I do have a video at the top link above to refresh your memory. So it says that there are only red buttons, yellow buttons, and orange buttons in a jar. The number of red buttons, um, the number of yellow buttons, and orange ones are in a ratio 7 over 9. So I always like to rewrite what the question is trying to say, because sometimes too many words can confuse people. So it's always nice to make it simple. So the 7 is the red, the middle is the yellow, and the last number is the orange. It wants us to work out the percentage of buttons in the jar that are orange. So always make it into a fraction. So your denominator of your ratio fraction is when you add up all the ratios together. So 7 plus 4 is 11, 11 plus 9 is 20. Then we know out of 20, 9 are orange, so 9 out of 20. We can simplify this. Or we can keep it the same. Actually, we cannot simplify it, so I don't know why I just said that. But to make it into a percentage, we always times fractions by 100 to convert them into percentage. And so by doing that, there's an easier way we can do this, actually. Rather than times them by 100, because that would leave you with 900 divided by 20, which some people may not like as a calculation to do. Actually, no, you could still do it. So 900 divided by 20. I'll show you another way of doing it. So 900 divided by 20, cancel the two zeros. So you're left with 90 divided by 2, which is 45 as a percentage. Or another way of working it out is 9 over 20. To get to 100 as a denominator, you'd have to times 20 by 5. And if you times 9 by 5, you also get 45. So 45 out of 100 is the same as 45%. So either way, we ended up with our answer of 45%. Okay, so that moving on to question 16. Question 16 then goes on to say, um, Berenika wants to buy 35 t-shirts. Each t-shirt is £5.80. She does the calculation, um, 40 times 6 is equal to 240 and estimate the cost of 35 t-shirts. Um, explain how Berenika's calculation shows the accurate cost will be less than 240 pounds. Okay, so each t-shirt is £5.80. So basically, Okay, so what she's done is she rounded up the cost of the t-shirt and rounded up how many t-shirts she has and then she ended up with an estimate of 240. But actually, her actual cost will be less than 240. And the reason why is because she estimated both, not estimated, sorry, she rounded Both, wow, <laughs> both with an E, both the number of t-shirts and the cost of each t-shirt up. So the actual cost would be less than 240. Or you can say anything along those lines. So there's a special offer, we all love a good bargain, where it says that each t-shirt is, is £5.80. Um, so it says buy 30 or more t-shirts and you get 10% off. So work out the actual cost. Right, so one t-shirt is £5.80 and we buy, she wants to buy 35 So what we're going to do is we're going to do 35 times £5.80. So in order to do this, some people don't like multiplying with decimals, so we can change £5.80 into a whole number. So we can change it into 580 So. 
580 times by 35. So 5 times 0 is 0, 5 times 8 is 40, carry the 4, um, 5 times 5 is 25, plus the 4, which is 29. And then 3, well, because it's 30s, we have carried the 0, but then also 3 times 0 is 0. 3 times 8 is 24, carry the 2. 3 times 5 is 15, plus the 2, which is 17. Add that all together which is 0, 0, 3, 1, and then 9 plus 1, which is 0, plus the 1, sorry, yeah, 9 plus 1, which is 10, <laughs> 0, carry the 1, and then 1 plus 1 is 2. Then, because we ended up moving forward two decimal places, remember, we have to move back. So, 35 times 5.80 will leave us with an answer of 203 pounds but because it's a 10 percent off we need to work out 10 percent of 203 a quickest way of doing that is moving back one decimal place from your answer that's a quick way of doing divide by 10 because 10 has one zero um so then we know one sorry 10 percent is equal to 20 pound 30 pence so we'll do 203 take away 20 pound 30 pence so we know that 0 minus 0 is 0. 0 minus 3 we cannot do, so carry the 1, which is 7. Then 2 minus 0 is 2. Oh, is 2. <laughs> and then 0 minus 2 we cannot do, so take the 1, carry it, and then 8, and then 1 minus 0 is 1. And so the actual cost will be £182.70. Okay, and then having a look at question 17. So, looking at question 17, it basically says that there are three cards in a box A and then three cards in box B. So it says that Ryan takes a card at random from box A and a card from box B. He adds two numbers um, he adds together the numbers of the two cards to get a total score. So we need to work out the probability of it being an odd number. So really and truly looking at the outcomes, we can draw a um, probability tree. Or another way of doing it is, because trees can sometimes get long for some people, So, here is our box A, here is our box B. The different options of numbers are in box A, are 3, 4, and 5. In box B, it is 2, 9, and 3. Add the different combinations together, because you would total scores of adding the numbers together. So, we'd have 5 there, 6, 7, 14... So yeah, we'd have 14, 8, oh, 8, 7, 13, 6, 12. So we have nine outcomes in total. And the ones that are odd, I'm going to circle them in red. So we have the 5, 7, 13, and the 7. So out of nine, four of the outcomes will be odd. And then moving on to question 18, Harry, Regan and Kellen share 450 pounds. Another question ratios. Remember my link above for ratio video helps. So yeah, if we write out the ratio, I'll put H for Harry, R for Regan, K for Kellen or Keelan. So how much does Keelan get? So in total, add up the ratio numbers. So 5 plus 2 plus 3 is 10. So we would have to do 450 because that's the total divided by 10, which you can just take one off, which is 45, aka move forward a decimal place. Um, so we know that one part is equal to 45. And so Keelan has three parts. So we'd have to do 3 times 45 which would be £135. 
Then question nine. Um, Jenny wants to make two hundred and four. Sorry, not two. <laughs> Twenty four flapjacks, but we've got the recipe for um sixteen. So we know that. 24 take away 16 is 8. Notice how 8 is half of 16. So really and truly to get from the recipe of to work out how much you would need to 24 flapjacks is the same as multiplying the recipe of 16 flapjacks by 1.5. So Jenny wants to make 24 flapjacks, so how much of the each ingredient would she need? So we're just going to multiply everything by 1.5 really. Or work out half of it and then add it on to what one of it is. So half of 120 is 60, half of 140 is 70, half of 250 is 125, half of one tablespoon is, sorry, two tablespoons is one. So add those halves on and you basically work out how much you need for 24. So having a look at that, for the butter, it would be 180. For the brown sugar, it'll be 210. For the oats, it would be 375. And for the syrup, it would be three. And then having a look at question 20, Amy and Josh use a calculator to work out 595 over this. So Amy's answer is that, and Josh's answer is that. So we have to use approximations to work out the right answer. So having a look at this question and basically when it comes to questions on approximation, the key is basically approximate is to kind of like round to like a nicer number. Bear in mind, you don't have a calculator for this question. So there's no way in hell they're expecting you to understand these numbers in your head. So if we have a look at Wow, not highlighter. <laughs> if we have a look at 595, we can nicely approximate that to 600. And 4.08, we can round to 4 squared. And then 5, we can round to 5.3, we can round to 5. So then, having a look at this now, we know that 4 squared is 16. So we can do the bottom is 16 plus 5, which is 21. Then realistically, doing 600 divided by 21 is not going to leave you with a really nice number. So we can approximate that into 20. So 600 divided by 20, cancel the two zeros, you're left with 60 divided by 2, which is 30. And realistically, between the two answers, Amy's answer is correct. Because Amy's answer is 27, and 27 is way closer to 30 than 271. Um, so yeah, Amy's answer is correct, as it is the closest. Okay, so now looking at question 21, um, it wants us to give our answer in standard form. You lot know I love standard form, why? Because I have a video um, on the link above nice little bit of promo so doing some standard form what we can do actually is that we can convert these numbers into standard form then do the whole multiplication division so if we have a look 0 0.06 can be changed to so move that forward two spaces um you end up with six and so in standard form it's the same as saying six times ten to the minus two because if you were to move back two spaces, you end up with 0 0.06. Um, 0 0.0003, written in standard form, if we look at how many numbers between the old decimal place and the new one that we're going to stick it, it's four. Because it's a small number, it's going to be to a negative power. And then 0 0.01 in standard form is a space of two. So negative power because it's a small number, so one times 10 to the minus two. Right, and then we know that 6 times 3 is 18. Then if we're multiplying two powers with the same base number, we end up adding. So minus 2 plus minus 4. Remember, if you've got a plus and a minus next to each other, it's going to end up being subtracting the rules. So minus 2 minus 4 leaves us with minus 6. So we end up with 18 times 10 to the minus 6 divided by 1 times 10 to the minus 2. Then now when it comes to dividing, 18 divided by 1 
is 18. But then now if we're dividing two powers with the same base number, you end up taking away the powers. So minus 6 minus minus 2, two minuses together become a plus, while plus, so minus 6 plus 2 would be minus 4. So we'd have 18 times 10 to the minus 4. However, this is not complete because remember in our standard form, the first number needs to range between 1 and 9.99. So we're going to have to change this. So if you move one decimal place back to make it 1.8, we have to add 1 to the power. And so our final answer would be, if I write it down here, 1.8 times 10 to the minus 3. And then having a look at question 22. So adding fractions. Oh my gosh, I have a video on fractions on the link above. Come on, we really have to just promote ourselves over here. So let me crack on. So 2 over 5 plus 1 over 4. So with fractions and adding them, they need to have the same denominator. So 2 over 5 times the top and the bottom by 4. The 1 over 4 times the top and the bottom by 5. That's going to change our fractions into 8 over 20 plus 5 over 20, which will leave us with 23, not 23, wow, that'll leave us with 13 over 20, and we can't really simplify this any further, so that is going to be our final answer. And then it says it wants us to write down the value of 2 to the power of minus 3, so whenever you've got to a negative power, you basically want to work out, sorry, you change it to a reciprocal. So, if we have 2 to the power of minus 3, reciprocal would be a half. And then because you've changed it to reciprocal, the power will therefore become positive. Then we're going to end up cubing both top and the bottom numbers, which would leave us with 1 over 8. And that is the final answer. So, moving on to question 23, which I also have a video on, prime factors. Come on, come on. So, we need to do our prime factor of 3. So one of the ways we can do this, remember, I always say with prime factors, there's different ways. But one way you can do it is 4 times 9. 4 can be split out into 2 and 2. 9 can be split out into 3 and 3. And they are all prime factors. So therefore, you can either write your answer as 2 times 2 times 3 times 3. They would give you the mark. Or I like to write in the neater way of collecting it together. Because we have two twos, it will be 2 squared. We have three twos, so it'll be three squared. So two squared times three squared, and they will give you the mark for writing it either way. So having a look at question 24, Kiara um, is seven years older than Jay. Martha is twice as old as Kiara, and the sum of all their ages is 77. So we have to find the ratio of all their ages. So K, aka Kiara, is 2J, because Oh gosh, no, it's J plus 7, because she's 7 years older than J. M, Martha, is twice as old as K, so 2 times K, 2K. And we know that J plus J plus 7, aka Kiara, plus 2K, aka Martha, is equal to 77, right? So... Having a look at this, we know that 2j plus 7 plus 2k is equal to 77. Take away 7 from both sides, 2j plus 2k is equal to 70. 2 bracket j plus k is equal to 70. So then divide by 2 and you end up with 35, so j plus k is equal to 35. And then, in terms of working it out, if we know j plus k is equal to 35, we essentially know that k is the same as saying 35 minus j. So, if we know that k is equal to that, which is the same as 35 minus j, that is really going to help us because j plus 7 is equal to 35 minus 
j. So if we're to add j to both sides, there's a reason why I'm saying that. 2j plus 7 would be equal to just 35. So 2j is equal to 35 minus 7, which is 28. So j is equal to 14. So j is 14 years old. If we know how old j, j is, we know how old Kiara is because 17, sorry, 14 plus 7 is 21. We know how old Kiara is, we know how old Martha is. And if Kiara is 21, 21 times 2 is 42. So it wants a ratio of J, then Kiara, then Martha. So therefore, our answer would be J's first, which is 14. Kiara's, which is 21. Martha's, which is 42. So that is basically the ratio of their ages. You can leave your answer like this. You don't need to simplify it because it wants a ratio of their ages. It doesn't want just a simplified ratio. And technically, this is a ratio of their ages. So that's one way of working it out. And then question 25, not long left, guys. So it says that it wants us to show that the angle ABF is 70 degrees, basically. So there are a few ways of working this out. So I do also have a video on angles and parallel lines and angles and polygons. So I'm going to stick that up. But actually, I'm going to stick up the one in angles and parallel lines because that's mostly useful here. So looking at this question, we do know a rule to do with C angles. I remember how I did also mention in that um, video that try not to use the term C, F or um, Z but I'm just mentioning it just so you're familiar with it. So when you have, so supplementary angles, okay. Yeah, sorry, not supplementary. Co-interior. Add up to 180 degrees. And so that means that if we did 180 take away 75, we would be left with 105. So we know that this massive angle here needs to add up to 105. But then we can also see a Z angle form, also known as the proper mathematical name, alternate angles. And we know that alternate angles are the same. Very important to write your reasoning because it always, with these questions, when it says give a reason, give your reasons because they may not be able to give you the marks if you don't clearly state your reasons. So the reason why that's useful is because, first of all, when you've got a cross shape form, the opposite angles of the cross are the same. So if that side's 35, that's 35 degrees. And because we've got our Z angle here, whatever that angle is here is the same as that angle here. So if we know that's 35, then here is 35. So because we know this whole thing is 105 degrees and a part of it is 35, the last rule really and truly to show that ABF is 70 is that if the whole thing is 105 degrees, to work out this individual part, aka ABF, we would have to do 105, take away 35, which would leave us with 70 degrees. So there are multiple ways you could have worked this out, but this is just one of the ways that I found easiest. So looking, uh, having a look at question 26, um, it says that we've got a circle with a center. O. So it says each circle, circle center is O. Daisy says that it's exactly a third of the logo is shaded. So is Daisy correct? So Daisy, are you correct? Let's have a look at what you've basically worked out. So if it's saying a third of the logo is shaded, what we need to do is work out the area of the whole logo and then work out the area of what is shaded. So the area of the whole logo, aka would be the area of the whole circle. Which, if we have a look, 4 plus 3 plus 3 is 10. So we know that this whole radius of the whole circle would be 10. So we know the area of a circle is pi r squared. But because we don't really have our calculators, we're just going to approximate. So when we approximate with pi, we say... 
we could just leave it with the pi. You don't even need to change it to pi is equal to 3. So because the radius is 10, square of 10 is 100. So we know our area of the whole circle is 100 pi, right? Then if we're saying that only a third of it is shaded, what we now need to do is work out the of the small circle by working out the area of the small circle we would then also need to work out the area of the shaded circle take them away from each other so that's just imagine that's been taken away that will allow us to work out what this area is and then basically that area out of the total should be equivalent to a third so what I mean by that, let me actually put what I've just said into practice. So the area of the small circle would be 4 squared times pi, which is 16 pi. The area of the intermediate circle, so the middle one, would be 7 squared times pi, because these add up to 7, aka 49 pi. If we were to do 49 pi take away 16 pi, we would end up with 33 pi. And so that's going to be the area of this shaded region. And so the shaded region, 33 pi, out of 100 pi is not equivalent to a third. And the reason why is because 33 out of 100 will be close to a third because this is close to a third but notice how daisy says that this exactly a third and because this is not exactly a third and that is why she is wrong so next we've got question 27 it says that it wants to estimate the mean of the weekly earnings so if we're going to estimate the mean this is kind of like dealing with frequency polygons. And remember, when we're doing that, you'd have to do your midpoint times your frequency. So midpoint here is 200. 200 times 1 is 200. Then here it would be 300 times 11, which would leave us with an answer of 3,300. Then 400 times 5, which is 2,000. That would just be 0. 600 times 3, which is 1,800. Add them all together. Which would be 0, 0, 3, carry the 1, 7. So we've got 7,300. Then we need to divide that by how many people there are, which is 20. So again, because we have a 20, we can take off one of the zero, and that would be the same as 730 divided by 2. Then that divided by 2 would just leave us with 365. And that would be the final answer. So... Then it now says, so just writing it here, then it now goes on to say the mean may not be the best average to use as a representative. So I would say yes, because of the zero, because zero is an outlier. So this would affect the mean yeah so anytime that your frequency looks really out of place then yeah i would say that's going to affect the mean so i would say no oh not saying that no that not to what i mean by no is no i wouldn't use the mean so yes i agree with what nadia was saying so moving on to question 28 we are near to the end so it says all measurements are in centimeters and the area of the rectangle is 48 centimeters squared and it says that show that y is equal to three okay so we know that an area of a rectangle is
length times width. So this one is quite interesting because really and truly, these two would be the same. Um, but notice how they've written them differently. So we can do many ways of doing this. We can work out what X is, substitute that in, and then by knowing what X is, we can work out what Y is. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. So as I mentioned, they're the same. So 2X plus 6 is equal to 5X minus 9. So we're going to add 9 to both sides, and that's going to leave us with 2X plus 15 is equal to 5X. If we then take away 2x from both sides, we would be left with 15 is equal to 3x. So then x would be 15 divided by 3, which is 5. So if I know x is 5, then this would really and truly be 2 times 5 plus 6, which is 16. And this side would be 5 times 5 minus 9 which would be 25 minus 9, which is also 16. Notice how they're the same. So now, in terms of working out the area, it's length times width. So if I know my length is 16 times my width of y, which I don't know what it is, and that's equal to 48, to work out what y is, I'm just going to do 48 divided by 16. And so 48 divided by 16 would leave us with an answer of 3. So that is how I have shown that y is equal to 3. So question 29, we've got a graph and we have to write down one thing that is wrong. So really notice what they say in these questions, guys. They try and make it as easy for you as possible. If we're just noting one thing that is wrong, um, this graph is meant to be a quadratic graph because we've got x squared plus 1. So if it's meant to be a quadratic graph, quadratic, I can't speak. <laughs> quadratic graphs should be a curve. And you shouldn't really use a ruler. So I was really like, should be a curve shape. Because if we really look at this, it doesn't really look curvaceous. So we want it to be curvaceous. And then the last question of the day is to do with percentages. So in a sale, the normal price of a book is reduced by 30%. And the sale price is now £2.80. So we have to work out the normal price. So this is the reduced price. This is when the price is now 70% rather than to be 100%. So if I know £2.80 is equal to 70%, to work out what 100% is, if I divide both of these values by 10, sorry, I have a better way of doing that. If I divide, there's many ways of doing this, by the way, but if I divide both values by 7, I work out what 10% is. So two pound eighty divided by seven would give me forty pence, also known as that. So to work out what a hundred percent is, we have to times by ten. And so a hundred percent would be equal to four hundred pence, which is aka four pound four pounds. So the final answer of the day is four pounds. And we've come to the end of the past paper. I just want to say well done, guys, for getting through this with me. I hope this was useful. And, yeah, stay tuned for more content. Bye. And how can I forget? Do not forget to like, comment, subscribe for more content on this channel. Please, please, guys. I really want this academy to grow and just be useful for all of you students. So, yeah, thank you for watching, guys.